Hello, and welcome to my video presentation upon post-processual archaeology and its methods. My name is Riley Wildman, and I'm doing a Bachelor of Archaeology. My main research question is upon the criticality of this school of archaeology, and if its political and socio-political influence has had the desired effect of countering post-processualists' perceived shortcomings of processualism, as well as post-processualism's rise, meaning, and critique. In this presentation, I'll be analysing concepts that may not, at first, seem related to archaeology, yet they have had extreme influence on the discipline's sphere. Pictured here is what I will be outlining, beginning with post-processualism and when it developed, followed by critical archaeology and critical theory. Then, Marxism and neo-Marxism's influence will be discussed, as well as the development of Soviet archaeology, which emerged from the tenets of Marxism and Soviet bias. Finally, I'll be finishing this presentation by observing the pros and cons of post-processual thought, and then finishing with potential limitations and my critique or final thoughts on this school of archaeology. Post-processual archaeology formed in the United Kingdom in the 1970s by archaeologists Ian Hodder, Christopher Tilley, Peter Ucko and Daniel Miller, who did not believe in certain principles of processual archaeology and wished to contextualise their practice in a way they deemed more appropriate. These archaeologists also believed that reliance upon scientific methods in archaeology led to shortcomings for the discipline. This discipline then became widespread in the United States of America in the 1980s, so the main principles for post-processualism emphasise a more subjective approach, in conjunction with a theoretical paradigm of Marxist ideals and critical theory and structuralism. These concepts will be further analysed in the next slide. But an excellent way to categorise post-processualism is this quote, is everything simply a matter of interpretation? Post-processual archaeology analyses human behaviour in response to social change and social contexts, along with the context behind which decisions are made. This school of archaeology also relies upon symbols being used in order to comprehend culture and cultural evolution, and how subjective social histories can be interpreted by artefacts and the people who use them. The premise of post-processual archaeology was to create a new school of thought that highlights shortcomings of other schools, such as processual archaeology, and steals one's own knowledge against limitations that were conceived by processualists. But it also arose as a way to postulate on the past in an alternative way, and its practitioners seek as unbiased research as possible, as former life experience, schooling, and preconceived notions generate bias, even within the scientific method. There is heavy emphasis upon materialist and idealist notions in post-processualism, but it counters this by using ethnographic data and social structures of modern societies or cultures in order to formulate hypotheses and understand that these are not inherent conclusions. Post-processualism also re heavily relied, or was influenced, by the feminist archaeology movements of the 70s and 80s, as well as stressing the importance of a context and symbols as a way of defining meaning and cultural histories, as well as the individual who uses it and the importance of their individual agency. Now moving on to critical archaeology and critical theory. Critical archaeology is a marrying of archaeology and critical theory, with guiding principles and influence from Marxism. Critical theory can be briefly summarised by stating that a society's or culture's power, social and political structures can potentially be analysed through the use of reflective comparison and assessment. This form of social philosophy has roots in literary criticism, therefore it is of no coincidence that post-processualism relies rather heavily upon such critical theories, or what is now called more colloquially, critical archaeology. This is not as much of a branch as it is a predilection toward or preference for their archaeology, as well as arguing that it is not the individual, but social structure that creates inherent social structural issues. This critical archaeology goes hand in hand with Marxist ideals, or as it came to be known, Marxist ide archaeology, or ideologies. A famous archaeologist teaching critical archaeology would be Mark P. Leon and his students' work in their Annapolis, Maryland A. City Archaeology Project, which aims to contextualise the history and prehistory of the city with criticality as a lens. This is important as critical archaeologists in particular analyse marginalised groups and their records or ethnographic data in order to create a broader context for a site or collection of sites. Critical archaeology also importantly questions socially accepted ideas and dogma, such as capitalism or social structuralist concepts, to contextualise data. 
It also seeks to understand the reasons and processes behind certain constructions, both political and social, and what stressors or factors cause these to be created. The archaeology of gender is also an important factor in critical archaeology, with two main facets being present, with that of women as archaeologists and gender, and women amongst archaeological records, once again showing the close ties of post-processual archaeology with that of gender archaeology. Now, the influence of Marxism and critical theory. So to what extent has Marxism and critical theory impacted the methodology of post-processualism and its practitioner's theoretical approach? Marxism contributed classism into archaeology and how humans being free agents interact in social or personal interests. Yet, what gets attributed most to Marxist influence in post-processualism would be that of steering the discipline to a more politically charged or socio-political sphere, as well as viewing class conflict as a catalyst for developing culture and society within groups. A small group within Marxist circles, however, in post-processualism, took a more culturally determinist approach, believing that human agency is not consequential when interpretation is considered. Some processualists of the time were heavily critical of the new post-processual ideological movement. With older, stricter processualists came their stinging criticism of post-processualism. Also, stating that it possessed no scientific rigidity or objectivity, they instead saw it relying too heavily upon cultural subjectivity and social structures, as well as relying upon more modern, socialist, neo-Marxist dogma to analyse past human sociology and histories. Sir Richard J.C. Atkinson wrote scathing remarks of an early pre-post-processualist book, Symbolic and Structural Archaeology, in which he wrote, whether structuralism conceived as an approach to speech and language alone has any relevance for archaeology, where the evidence is above all dumb. And finished by stating that a meretricious attraction for those who treat jargon as a substitute for thought. He was one of many archaeologists at the time who held such opinions. Ian Hodder, who himself was a post-processual archaeologist, also had critiques upon the Marxist and neo-Marxist doctrine within post-processualism and held four pertinent points. It was insensitive adaptation of cross-cultural viewpoints which deal with ideological expression and their symbols, that the polarity between social reality and ideological facets in which they assume that the same experiences are had by different individuals of groups or entire groups, that the blatant lack of study or regard for the origins of ideological concepts and how they may generate, adapt or evolve when in conjunction with their environments. And finally, and also quite contradictory, is the belief that ideological ideas and concepts are shared by all members of a related society. So therefore, Marxist archaeology can be briefly summarised as a discipline that possesses a processualist approach that emphasises a materialist base and the development of historical contexts with archaeological data. The continuous reconstruction of the past by researchers and scholars, Marxist archaeologists believe, is due to the bipolarization of processual and post-processual thought and their conflict of ideas. Now, being analysed in the next slide is Soviet archaeology, as Marx's work influenced that without a doubt. Now, a Soviet archaeology? Although at first one would not necessarily relate archaeology with the political and social theory of Karl Marx, his rhetoric did influence archaeology, and this merger was originally made by Soviet archaeologists in the late 1920s and early 1930s, with an approach and doctrine inspired by Leninist Marxist teachings. A main and consistent research point of Soviet archaeology was that of social changes, particularly in a materialist manner. For instance, a commonly recurring theme is that of social change from primitive socialism to slavery to feudalism and then to capitalism. A famous archaeologist and historian, A. V. Artikovsky, famously remarked, Archaeology is history armed with a spade. Through the study of language and linguistics, or as it was known at the time, Japhetic theory, the predominant method of Soviet and later post-processual archaeology arose... As through studying Proto-European language, it was hypothesized that a Caucasian-based language existed before the Indo-European languages, and these implications led to a cultural and social stressors and how these sudden changes occurred within specific populations.
Much later, similar Soviet tenets came to fruition in the West, first spreading to the United Kingdom in small contextual amounts and influenced post-processual archaeology and its focus upon social and symbolic elements, which also contributed to the criticism of the scientific method. From this, critical archaeology flourished as another element of post-processualism, as mentioned in the previous slides. It focused critically on social and ethno-historical concepts. Of course, in the 1980s and 1990s, this saw a resurgence of Marxist archaeology and its social emphasis, even after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, the pros and cons of the post-processualist school. As can be seen from the slide, the pros and cons of post-processualism are highlighted. The pros of post-processualism are as follows. Humans as free agents, and that their actions should be separated from a group, and that all individuals possess their own agency. This was a direct criticism of processualism, as it was perceived as not subjective enough. Humans bend ecological rules to fit sociological purposes or structures. Marginalised groups were promoted throughout archaeology in order to create greater overlapping contexts. Subjectivity was seen as of paramount importance, rather than relying upon facts that could be seen as ethnographically obtuse or adhere to Eurocentric standards. There was also a knowledge that personal bias will always be present, as each archaeologist shall have preconceived notions or learned experiences. And arguably the most important influence post-processualism had was that of greater specialisation and diversity in archaeology, with new schools of thought consistently being created thereafter. For all its benefits, there are definitely some potent criticisms of post-processualism. Some of these include, for the abundance of criticism that post-processualism levelled at its predecessor, it eventually returned to the tenets that it once criticised. And as will be discussed in the next slide, the argument of post-processualism's succession of processualism. No comprehensive or baseline methodology was ever produced by post-processualist practitioners. A lack of scientific rigour meant that interpretation took the forefront of contextual analysis, sometimes over that of factual interpretation. Finally, ideology and its origins was heavily ignored by post-processualism to the point of insensitivity, which is rather peculiar as post-processualism works within the bounds of Marxist ideology, in which Marx believed that social impact and ideology can be dependent upon one another. So in hindsight, some archaeologists have either criticised or agreed with some facets or ideas put forth by post-processualists. For instance, Paul Barn and Colin Renfrew are quoted as saying, For its most severe critics, post-processualism, while making a number of valid criticisms, simply developed some of the ideas and theoretical problems introduced by processualism. So many critics also saw that post-processual epithet as tinged with arrogance, as with postmodernism superseding modernism, post-processualism did not necessarily do the same. It simply wished to shift its focus as it deemed certain research methods as unnecessary. And the final criticism of this school by other experts would be that Robert Prussell and Timothy Earle, who deemed the post-processual movement as a radical critique as it struck out against the status quo of the time. Now, onto limitations, perceived shortcomings, and critique. Some of my interpretation will be present here. Processualists who had been working within the precepts of archaeology under their school's thought for many years instantly struck back against post-processualists by identifying that a lack of scientific guidelines and next to no objectivity would instantly lead to issues with interpretation and conducive research. Another pertinent point would be that social identities and groups can only be formed by individuals. Furthermore, it is individuals that possess class, race, or gender. Yet, post-processualism categorised these individuals as empty vessels, apart from their symbolic elements. Therefore, archaeological interpretations can only identify human action as either or interactions. A very important contribution by post-processualism, however, would be that of diversification in archaeology, and the ability for each researcher to assign themselves to important elements such as race, gender, or class, and will therefore develop expertise in this category. However, I do believe some of these severe criticisms levelled at post-processualism in its infancy can potentially be whittled down to how stringent and methodical processual thought was at the time, with a strict methodology and scientific rigour. 
The other main reason for backlash would be the context of the time, as within the 1970s to the 1990s, the Red Scare was taking place, where all things communist or socialist were seen as subversive, distasteful, or politically obtuse. I believe that this would impact the reception of concepts and schools of archaeology such as Marxist archaeology, critical archaeology, and post-processionalism, as it utilises tenets of the former. Finally, the impact of criticality and social analysis within post-processionalism is important. However, it was taking an approach that was too opposite to that of processionalism, a more inclusive and potentially more effective method of archaeological interpretation may have been a happy medium between the two disciplines. Potentially with the stricture of scientific rigour and methods of processualism, combined with the free agency, criticality and social analysis of data debate may have been avoided and a mutual middle ground may have been achieved with the positive constructive methods of two schools being combined and utilised. And finally, these are my references that I used in my work. Thank you very much for listening.